Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're about to get underway here for our uh, special session with Mark Bittman today. We're waiting for a few more people to come in. We've had a lot of people RSVP, so we're just going to give it a minute or two as people come on board. All right. Looks like we've got a critical mass of folks coming into the session today. I want to welcome everyone here. Hi, my name is Amy O'Leary and I'm the Chief Content Officer at Knowable. We are really excited to bring you uh, this live chat today with Mark Bittman, who is incredible. If you don't already know him, um, he's just a legend in food. He's a best-selling author on literally how to cook everything. He was a longtime columnist at the New York Times um, and, and he really has helped us in the course that he worked on with us at Knowable think through how to eat right now. A lot of great questions and a lot of great information in his course about how to think about shopping and cooking and your own priorities. And I can tell you for me, uh, since working on the course with Mark, I am eating very differently every day. My uh, lunches have been completely revolutionized and it's so simple and I was really energized by it. So I'm really glad that he's here to talk to us about Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, welcome Mark to the chat. It's great to be here. Thanks Amy and hello everyone and hi Saru. <laughs> hey, let me introduce Saru too. Uh, Saru Jayaraman is here with us. She is the president of One Fair Wage, an amazing nonprofit that Mark supports and the course is supporting. And we're really excited to have her here. We're going to talk with her a little bit later in the session about what they're up to. Um, and to start off, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a chat, talk about some themes, some basic themes around Thanksgiving and some common questions. And then we're going to um, open it up for your questions. So as we begin, please go ahead and think about those questions that you're going to have. You can add them in our our Q&A session in the Zoom chat at any time. Um, but to kick it off, uh, we did want to say, hear a little bit from you all who joined us today. Um, and we wanted to, to send out a quick poll about your Thanksgiving plans to get us kicked off. So we'll go ahead and send that out to you. It should pop up on your screen. You can participate that way. And I'll get started. Um, you know, Mark, I know you're, you're, a lot of your philosophy, oh, sorry, here we are, we're asking how you're feeling about Thanksgiving this year, right? Uh, it's definitely a different year, a different kind of celebration for many people. Wondering if you guys are feeling hopeful or maybe a little uncertain or uh, scaling back, or maybe you're not sure what to do. Uh, so let us know and we'll, we'll take that here. So Mark, again, your philosophy around food and cooking really centers on simplicity and that's so such a big part of the reason why we wanted to uh, have you teach a course on how to eat now. And can you talk about how that applies to Thanksgiving? How do you think about this day, which is like the Super Bowl of food, uh, given your philosophy and orientation towards eating and cooking? Super Bowl of food, that's great. Uh, first, I'd like to note that hosts and panelists can't vote on the poll. So um, I feel like my vote has been stolen. Uh, I'm just <laughs> noting. Um, I, I've said the same thing about Thanksgiving for a long time, which is that people are, people take comments like the Super Bowl of food very seriously. And, and many of us grew up in, uh, in places where Thanksgiving was really, really intense. Um, I know it was for me and my family. And, um, 12, 15, 20 people at a table, your grandmother or your aunt or whatever screaming at the top of her lungs, um, very high pressure situations. And, um, and I, I'd like to vote against that. Um, I, I have no problem with um, meals with 10 or 12 or however many number of people. In fact, I like them. Obviously this year presents special challenges in that arena, um, but we're not here to talk about COVID. Uh, but I think that people are, their reaction to being intimidated by doing Thanksgiving is to overcompensate. And if you think about what most people's lives are like on a kind of daily basis is they're cooking for themselves and a partner or roommates or a couple kids or all of the above. And they're cooking one or two dishes for three or four people, five people, whatever, in a big family, seven people. Then they go to Thanksgiving and suddenly decide that they're gonna cook 10 dishes for 12 people. So if you do the math, you go from making, let's say eight or 10 servings to 100 or 150 servings. And most of us just can't handle that. And that's why, you know, my Aunt Flossie freaked out and um 
and and you always you know you see these freak outs at thanksgiving with people screaming at each other and the people doing most of the cooking or you know in when i was young the one woman doing most of the cooking really wanted to kill everyone else by the time the meal was on the table um now maybe that was just my family but i don't but think it's just your family I, i'm in favor of i'm in favor of make three or four things make them really well ask your ask your guests to bring stuff ask your guests to bring dessert and and ask for help when you need it and so on and just trying to sort of simplify matters and calm things down a little bit. Right. Well, that sounds like that's what the results of our poll are reflecting, that most of the people here on this call, more than half, are really looking forward to some scaled down traditions. Um, so given that, Mark, what do you think uh, would make an essentialized Thanksgiving? If you were doing something smaller, maybe for two to four people, what would you plan for an essentialized classic, let's say, Thanksgiving? Well, I don't, do I care about classic? I mean, okay. I, I hear your question, but and, um, you know, turkey is one of the few edible animals that is actually indigenous to the Americas. So it's kind of cool that we do turkey, but no one really likes it. So um, <laughs> we just had this conversation. I just had this conversation with a young cook the other day, and um, I said, roast, roast a chicken. I mean, you can still have a bird, but but it doesn't have to be the, you know, this sort of massive overblown hormonal steroidal whatever turkey that weighs 18 <laughs> pounds and doesn't taste like much and people like it because they have it once a year but they only have it once a year because they don't like it much so right. i don't know it's a great time of year to eat and mostly it's a great time of year to eat because fall vegetables are in and and i'm not advocating a vegan or vegetarian thanksgiving although i'm fine with that but I think the reason many people focus on side dishes is that they're better than the turkey. Um, and so I would just say, make some really great dishes and enjoy yourself and, and maybe let the tradition, as the poll indicates people want to do, just relax a little bit about, you know, a massive turkey and sweet potatoes with marshmallows and all that other stuff that's just sort of feels old. It yeah. just feels old. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm seeing a lot of heat in the chat and we already have uh, some questions rolling into the Q&A uh, about, uh, about, you know, so if, what if you did want to go a little more plant-based for your Thanksgiving? Um, uh, how would you, do you have any suggestions for, for people on how they could start exploring that if maybe they haven't done that before? Well, I mean, I just went, thing? just before I came here, I picked up my CSA. There's one week left of the summer CSA. I'm on the East Coast. Um, and you know, I have this massive basket that I did not have time to unpack, but in it are sweet potatoes, parsnips, carrots, beets, regular potatoes, leeks, bok choy, white cabbage, kale. I mean, one or two other things. If, I mean, that is a feast right there. So if you wanna add meat to that, great. But um, to turn those things, I mean, parsnips, roasted parsnips, roasted carrots, mashed sweet potatoes. Um, I do this thing of grated beets turned into a, a sort of pancake that I like very much. I mean, obviously there, in, in the things I just named, there are thousands and thousands of options and most of them are more interesting than creamed pearled onions and and again i just can't stop thinking about cream the corn and the green bean casserole that right stuff. that kind of thing yeah right yeah. so if you're doing all that one one of the things you talked about in the course was to think about using meat you know maybe not always as this huge centerpiece but maybe better quality smaller portions how, how would would that play into a thanksgiving type of meal I mean, it, it really depends on whether you insist on the turkey or not. I mean, I think the funny thing about a traditional Thanksgiving is that um, people get these massive turkeys and they don't eat that much of them because again, they're just not that great. And because of all the side dishes, there's so much to eat that the turkey is kind of a, it's almost an ornament, right? <laughs> um, so, but you know, the meat is a condiment thing 
is really is really great. It's not a common. It's not a. This, I don't have an easy answer for that. So I'm thinking for a second. I mean, sausage stuffing is meat as a condiment. Any of the seasonal vegetables with a little bacon or ham is meat is meat as a condiment. I mean, those kinds of things. Uh, leftover turkey hash, of course, those kinds of things have more appeal to me than than massive, massive animals on the table, um, especially industrially raised meat, right. which is what most turkey is. So, right. Yeah. So we're already getting a lot of questions and I want to make sure uh, we're, we have time for them all. But I did want to ask that, you know, it, especially since so many families are doing a smaller scaled down celebration this year. Um, and food is really one way we can celebrate and be special. Let's say maybe you don't wanna stress yourself out and do the full 10 course thing, but how could you use this day to, to try something new or to, to push yourself a little to, to use food to celebrate in a way you might not normally in your everyday dinner? I mean, without being too preachy, I would, I would propose that we rethink Thanksgiving a little bit and ask what we're really thankful for. I'm not going to answer that question for everyone, but um, Thanksgiving was a, originally a, ho a holiday of sort of ce European celebrating overrunning an, of another continent. And, and I think that we, we should be conscious of that and we should be conscious of what our place on this land is and, um, who originally lived here um, and what our place on this land should be and what our relationship to food ought to be. And we, we, um, we've been through, we are in a period of great difficulty. We've been through a period of even greater difficulty. Um, I would imagine most of the people on this Zoom chat are feeling a great sense of relief, but, but that sense of relief is not shared by everyone, and I'm not talking about political differences. I'm talking about the difficulties of day-to-day -day lives of um, of being a less privileged person in the United States. And I think, um, you know, I think the traditions of Thanksgiving that have people uh, work in kitchens that cater to providing food for people who don't get it easily, or that that um, that truly show gratitude for the for those of us who are lucky enough to to be able to do that. I think those are, those are the really valuable Thanksgiving traditions. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to do one more quick poll before we uh, we move to kind of our next se section about what the most stressful part of Thanksgiving is for you this year. Let's get a sense of that. Can we send out that poll? It should be coming. All right. Would love to hear what you guys. Uh, God, those are tough questions. <laughs> right. I mean, I definitely feel like every family has that one favorite dish that somebody has to replicate, and that everyone judges it at the end of their, during the meal if they did grandma's stuffing right or the cranberry sauce right. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. So would love to hear what you guys have to say. Mark, do you get stressed out around the holidays, or are you just are you just super cool? I mean, I get stressed out whenever anyone comes to dinner, even though I preach, I always preach that it gets stressed out. I strongly believe that everybody is happy when you cook for them and that people are grateful to be cooked for. I, I do believe that, but that belief is not enough to conquer my neurosis. And, um, and I think like everybody else, I get nervous. I get nervous when people come over. So um, I don't know if stressed out is the right thing, but but again, that's why I think um, that's why I do recommend that we we try to keep things simple and we don't get overly ambitious and we try to just make a great meal for the people who are are you know who are coming over, presumably our loved ones. Um, the poll is interesting. It's not what I would have guessed. Yeah. So, uh, what would what were you going to guess, Mark? I, for me, it's like making other people happy. Like, <laughs> that's the source of stress. But I mean, I'm not having people over, so I'm not navigating the pandemic. Yeah. So, um, so the, I'm yeah, navigating it in a in an opt out way. So right. I'm hearing from Diane Stevens in the chat. No stress this year. I'm in Mexico, so we'll eat tacos. That's a nice opt out strategy. Um, 
And certainly people have all kinds of alternatives planned. Um, before we get to some of the really interesting questions I see are popping up, we've got a question about going crabbing. It's very good, good diverse, diverse uh, questions coming in. Yeah. Um, I wanna take a moment and introduce Saru. Um, and, and thank you for joining us. So uh, Saru is the president of One Fair Wage, which uh, is an amazing nonprofit that is really led by advocates for restaurant workers and some minimum wage practices uh, for tip workers who make less than the minimum wage. And, and Sarah, maybe you could just talk a little bit about, um, and, and again, we're really excited to have her here. And, and again, today's session is absolutely free to everyone. We hope if you feel uh, motivated or inspired or grateful for the advice here, you might consider tipping a donation to One Fair Wage. Um, so Sarah, can you just explain a little bit about One Fair Wage and the work you all do? Sure. And first, I, I want to thank Mark so much for um, always connecting these issues that it yes this this conversation is about cooking and it's about thanksgiving but how important it is to thank and remember and appreciate the people who cook and serve us you know every day all day americans eat out more than any other nation on earth and um and so it's i think particularly this year more than other years important to remember those folks that are so deeply struggling right now. And I'll just give two minutes of background as to why they're struggling. Um, before the pandemic, you know, the food system was 20 million workers. And of that, almost 14, some say 15 million of that 20 million was all in the restaurant industry. The restaurant industry has been both the largest segment of food workers, the largest private sector workforce in the United States, and also the lowest paid workforce. And a big reason for that is exactly what you mentioned. It's that in this country, um, thanks to a literal legacy of slavery, tipped workers, workers who receive tips in restaurants earn a sub-minimum wage, which is still $2.13 an hour at the federal level. Now it varies from state to state, but 43 states, so the vast majority of states have a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, and 40 of those states, the wage is under $5 an hour. So you're talking about four out of five states, the largest employer of workers, the largest workforce is earning under $5 an hour. These are mostly women. They're often single mothers working in casual restaurants and bars. And prior to the pandemic, they were struggling with very high rates of poverty and economic instability and sexual harassment. Well, what was an issue of inequality prior to the pandemic has truly become an issue of life or death during the pandemic because about 10 million of these workers lost their jobs or experienced underemployment during the pandemic and 60%, six zero, could not get unemployment insurance because they were told by most states that their sub-minimum wage of two or three dollars was too low to meet the minimum threshold to qualify for benefits. That left millions of workers unable to pay rent, unable to put food on their tables. We started a relief fund on March 16th for these workers, 250,000 workers applied from all 50 states. And at the beginning of the pandemic, they were saying, uh, thank you so much, I'll be able to buy groceries for the next month with this money you're giving me. And now they're saying, I'm telling you, I have to go steal food for my children because I have no choice. I'm telling you, I don't know how much longer I can be in touch with you because I can't pay my electricity bill, which means I may not have internet or phone um, and nobody's able to pay the rent. Lots of restaurant workers are living in parks in multiple cities and with winter coming, it's a very, very scary situation. Even worse, many workers are being called back to work right now for a sub-minimum wage of two or $3 when tips are down 50 to 75% and they're having to enforce social distancing and mask rules on the very same customers from whom they have to get tips to survive. It's a public health disaster. It's a disaster for the workers. And it's a disaster particularly for women because we're hearing so many egregious comments that these workers are getting. Hey, you know, server, take off your mask so I can judge your looks to determine how much I wanna tip you. Um, take off your mask so I can see how pretty is my server before I tip. We've heard about 40% of 2000 workers have said sexual harassment has gotten worse and that they're being asked to remove their protective gear essentially for the sexual pleasure of male customers. And I, I don't wanna bring us down in a conversation about Thanksgiving, but I do think that it's important as we all, I know I will be so happy to be with my family on Thanksgiving, and I'm sure everybody else will too. After all, that is what it's about now. You know, I think we can talk about the history later, but what it's about now is enjoying time and good food with our families. 
but I think this year it's important to remember that there are literally millions of people who feed us on a daily basis on this day that we're thinking about food, who cannot put food on their own families' tables, who often are not even in their homes anymore because they can't afford uh, the rent. <laughs> and there's a lot to be done about it. If people want to know what, what can we do? What can we do on Thanksgiving? What can we do going forward? There's a lot we can do. Um, so I, I, that, I wasn't able, like Mark said, as a panelist to answer the question. I'm feeling hopeful, especially with this election, because I don't know anybody's political leanings. And I, it's not about that. The person who was elected to be president democratically has committed to a $15 minimum wage and full elimination of the subminimum wage for tipped workers. So I'm feeling hopeful that with our encouragement, that could actually happen and we can end a legacy of slavery that's been around for 150 years. Thank you so much, Sarah. We have included the link to the One Fair Wage Emergency Fund and to their site here in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll keep at, we'll add that again later on through the chat so that all of you have um, access to be able to offer a donation or read more and learn more about the issue. Mark, is there anything you'd like to say? I know this is a, a cause that's been dear to your heart and that you're passionate about supporting. I think Sarah and I have known each other probably 15 years at this point, and she's just been one of my heroes through that period. And and um, if we're successful in getting a $15 an hour minimum wage nationally for all workers, that is in large part due to the work that she's done. And that is an enormous victory for, for millions and millions of people. So one thing she didn't mention is that eight of the 10 worst paying jobs in the United States are in, in the food world. And the irony, she may have said this, we've both said it many times, the horrible irony is that, um, or maybe it's a paradox, but um, the bad situation is that the people who feed us often can't afford to buy good food for themselves. And um, I, I just like to say that, that uh, the food system is not just about eating. It's not just about fun. It's not just about restaurants. It's about labor. It's about affordable, nutritious food. It's about protecting the environment. It's about really, really important issues. So um, I, I know that it's a, it's a bit incongruous to be talking about Thanksgiving and how much joy we can bring each other and, and so on which is important, but um, it's also important to recognize that, that food is not a simple issue and it's not just about, oh, how great it all is. It's really, really complicated and it has been and it's, it's going to continue to be complicated. So um, I, I don't think it's important for people to get depressed. I think it's important for people to be active, to recognize all the complications, how complex the food system is and everything around food is, and to act on that while continuing to cook and enjoy food and, and derive the pleasure that it brings us. So it's a, it's a bit of a, it's, it's a conundrum, but it's, it's what we have to deal with. Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons I was so uh, happy, Mark, that uh, you had room in this course with Noble to get into some of these bigger issues that you care about that are deeply connected to our food systems. In the Noble course, there are more than 20 lessons, some really practical about, you know, making that bread or, you know, the e easy master meals you can eat and some that connect a little more deeper into the food systems and the way they impact our lives. Um, so thank you for bringing up those issues there and bringing Saru and One Fair Wage into the conversation here. All right, so we have lots of questions that have come in. Um, we're gonna shift to that. So anyone, uh, you know, all of our attendees, you're welcome to put a question uh, either in the chat or in the Q&A session at the bottom of your Zoom screen for either Saru or Mark. Um, sounds like we've got some former servers here who, uh, sounds like Kathy was a server in the 80s who uh, can't believe that the sum minimum wage hasn't changed since she was working in the industry. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so I want to ask some questions. The first one uh, uh, we have is Jill Reynolds wanted to ask that she's going crabbing as a family the day before Thanksgiving. Do you have any recommendations for what they could do with Dungeness crab on this day? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> sounds great, by the way. Sounds like being out, you know, crabbing sounds incredible. 
It does. And they probably know much more about this than I do. <laughs> but if it's really Dungeness Crab, I will say the best and most unusual Dungeness Crab recipe I ever had was roast Dungeness Crab, rubbed with olive oil, sprinkled with salt, and roasted at high heat until it was done. And that was, I mean, I love boiled and cold Dungeness Crab, but that roasted thing, which I had in Vancouver was just out of this world. So um, we get smaller crabs on the East Coast and most people most of the time turn them into sauce because they are a pain in the neck. But um, Dungeness, is, Dungeness is the best. I'm an East Coaster, but I do agree with West Coast people that Dungeness crab is the best shellfish there is. So yeah, yeah. a little envious right. of that. Yeah, that's that sounds nice. I, you know, I, we've got another great question from Margaret Rosenberg, who is cooking for her team who's working in a hospital. She is planning individually packed clamshells for a main pie in the clamshells, covered cups for salad, beverages, disinfecting everything before packing. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about what she could do to make that work or make it safe? She says she's mostly anxious about safety. I mean, I think if she's wearing a mask and washes her hands and everybody else is too, it's probably cool. Um, it's, but you know, don't take it from me. It's not my field of expertise. All right. Um, Brad wants to know your best gravy and gravy strategies. Well, strategies, you know, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, there, when I first started writing the minimalist column, someone mentioned this in the chat. Um, had this wacky editor who said, we should do the minimalist Thanksgiving. I think you should figure out how to do Thanksgiving in an hour. And, and <laughs> um, I don't know, that to be an interest, I haven't looked at it in, that was probably 97. Right. Um, so I probably haven't looked at it in 15 years, but um, that included gravy. I mean, I, gravy is reduced pan juices thickened with a little flour or cornstarch and it's kind of as simple as that. So you take turkey out of the pan, maybe you degrease it a little bit with that is spoon off some of the fat, maybe you don't. And you pour in some water and boil that until it starts to thicken. And if you want really thick gravy, you stir in some cornstarch, but in my opinion, better is to stir in some butter and just take it from there. So, I mean, that's the, that's the simplest thing and it should be last minute. It should be the last thing you do, I think. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, A. Cuthbert wanted to know, how do you approach making something untraditional when your guests are expecting the traditional fare? Such how do you a set great the question. That is the question. <laughs> I mean, I think you have to set them up ahead of time. I, I did, um, I told Amy this story before we started, but I started writing about food in 1980 and I never had an editor who didn't say, what are you gonna do with the turkey story for this Thanksgiving? I mean, for years and years, what are you gonna do for Thanksgiving? How are you gonna do the turkey? Da, 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 da. Even in you know, 17, 18 years later, when I started The Minimalist, it was do the Minimalist Thanksgiving. And I gradually started to rebel. And mm -hmm. um, I started to do uh, how immigrants, um, did Thanksgiving, how non-Europeans did Thanksgiving, but also how people who grew up eating turkey could, could move away from that. And, you know, there, it's, a, it's a holiday that for many people represents bounty or that, that's the thought. And, um, and there are a lot, of, a lot of ways to celebrate that that are not, um, not quite so traditional. So a big, a big savory pie is an interesting thing. If you're a big meat eater, something like a crown roast of pork or a prime rib are, are you know, in my opinion, tastier, better cuts that, that survive the oven more than, better than turkey does. Um, but I, I think you have to set people up and say, we're doing something a little bit different this year. I think key is to, again, is to start with the assumption that people are happy to be coming. I mean, given whatever the particular quirks of your own families are, people are happy to be coming to other people's house and having other people cook for them. So mm -hmm. I'm ecstatic that you're coming for Thanksgiving. 
guess what? It's vegan this year. Or guess what? We're having a rib roast. Or, or guess mm -hmm. what? I'm making a seafood pie. I mean, whatever well, it is. And people will, they'll deal. They'll be happy. So Ben C had just that question. He wanted a, a, to ask you for a festive pescatarian alternative to turkey. Yeah, well, seafood pie is seafood a pie, bouillie base, awesome. I mean, I, look, once you abandon the turkey, you're completely off the map anyway. So, <laughs> you know, I, the, the, you might as well serve lasagna. I mean, and people do, <laughs> right? So, yeah. It's one works. of the best Thanksgivings I ever had. I was driving with an aunt of mine in North Carolina. We pulled over, we got peel and eat shrimp. And that was the Thanksgiving. It was great. Just got to embrace what, whatever direction you're headed into. Um, so uh, Diane wants to know for you, Mark, very personally, I'm dying to know what Mark enjoys eating. What are his favorites? I mean, for Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really varied from I'm trying to remember what I did last year. Um, yeah, last year I went to my sister's um, who cooks very much like my grandmother, which which is kind of cool. And there was a turkey, of course, but also brisket and potato pancakes. And it was kind of a, a Eastern European Jewish Thanksgiving. Um, I don't know. I've run the gamut. I've roasted salmon. I've done the crown roast of pork thing. Yeah. I've done bouillabaisse. I've done seafood pie. I, it is a nice time to sort of pull out all the stops, but um, I do take my own advice and try to keep it when I'm the one who's cooking, um, which I haven't been now that I think about it for three or four years. I try to keep it modest and, and rein things in so that I, I, I can actually enjoy myself. Yeah. Um, one of our anonymous attendees wanted to know what some excellent diabetic friendly side dishes for Thanksgiving would be. Well, so probably low on sugar. Yeah. I mean, isn't it? So maybe not the that? marshmallow, not the marshmallow thing. Right. I yeah. mean, most side dishes I think of are diabetic friendly. So yeah, low on sugar, vegetable dishes. I mean, straight vegetable dishes. Yeah. yeah. Non stuff, yeah. non white bread stuffing for sure. Right. So away from those simple carbohydrates. Um, th that, that brings us to our third and final poll, which is about the hotly contested side dish question. Uh, which is your essential side dish um, for your holiday? I know that there are some maps going around about uh, which states have a favorite side dish. Um, everything from green bean casserole. Here we go. Stuffing, cranberry sauce rolls. I know a big swath of the South likes their mac and cheese. I mean, this is great because these are like the worst. To me, this is all yes. anathema. This is the stuff that I would, I mean, I love mashed potatoes, but, and I- Can any know, of can, these be redeemed or are they all just terrible? <laughs> well, you know, the corn season is over. Mac and cheese is hardly a side dish. I mean, if you're making mac <laughs> and cheese, you might as well make it the main course. Green bean casserole, and you know, what? Sliced almonds and breadcrumbs, I guess. Stuffing, of <laughs> course, can be made great. Cranberry sauce, sauce can be made great, but not the canned stuff, obviously. Rolls is a very broad category. Right. Corn, I think I said, is out of season. So, um, yeah, I I bet that 80% that of the people on this call have more interesting side dishes in their Thanksgiving. We're, menus, we're hearing but... in, in the comments, Brussels sprout hash, Waldorf salad. There uh, you go. I don't know how to pronounce this, chermula. Is that... Tacos, someone said. Um, Hardly a side dish, but yeah. Right, but you know, I guess. <laughs> um, and and certainly there's some uh, alternative mains that people are talking, oh, stuffing looks like the essential one here for this group. For me, it's it's the cranberry sauce. I hate to say it, Mark, in a can. I like grew up with it and it's like a sense memory. I mean, um, it is a sense memory and I should have <laughs> some sometime. I could see the way it used to slide out of the can with the- Right, dents the rings. From the can, yeah, the rings. <laughs> I love the that. <laughs> And then you know how to slice it. It's perfect, but it is perfect. Um, so 60% uh, sugar, probably. That's true. That's true. Um, Not diabetic okay. friendly. Right. So Marcus heard, heard the words Mac and cheese and wanted to know your best recommendations for if you wanted to make Mac and cheese that main event, how could you make it special? Um, well, the sort of the lobster Mac and cheese, which is sort of an up and coming dish over the last few years is certainly special, but um, I like mac and cheese. I like baked pasta, which is what mm -hmm. mac and cheese is. 
Um, but once you, you know, once you call it mac and cheese, you're out of the realm of making it special. You're making it in the way that it's made, I think. And, um, you know, if you want to talk about pasta and cheese dishes, that's one thing. But mac and cheese to me is something very particular, which means the pasta is overdone. The cheese is not very good. It's baked in an oven uh, because that's what's traditional, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. the bad cranberries sauce. Right. That's what's traditional. <laughs> right. Um, this seems like a very COVID related question from Christy, who said, do you have any recommendations for recipes for Thanksgiving that can be prepared in individual servings like hand pies or cooked in some kind of personal pot? I'd like to avoid common serving utensils. Yeah, I mean, that is a very practical question. And um, the way that we've dealt with it, I mean, in this way, Thanksgiving is no different from, from serving dinner to anyone else in the era of COVID. I mean, the way we've dealt with it is, again, keep things very, very simple and all the serving happens by one or maybe two people and people get plates. It's not a people, buffet. Yeah. It's not a buffet. You're not passing at the table and so on. The last few meals, I mean, I haven't gone to, I haven't gone to, I haven't been in any big gatherings except in the middle of the summer, a couple outside, but I haven't gone to any meals with more than four people in quite a while, but um, the pattern that seems to work is the host makes plates for people. And, yeah. you know, if you trust the host enough to be in her, her house or his house, then you, you ought to trust them enough to, to serve you. But it's not, there's not a lot of food on the table. There's not passing, there's not buffets. I mean, all the kind of, not all the fun things, but a lot of the fun things about eating in a crowd are, they're just, they're, they're just not on right now. Right, right. Um, we have a question for Saru, and then I will give Mark a chance to catch his breath and come back. We have lots more questions coming in. But Libby wants to know, can you touch on employee-owned restaurants? Um, Libby says, I'm assuming they provide better wages, and that might be a better option if you're looking for a place to, to frequent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, employee ownership is great. It is a way for uh, to create democracy in the workplace. In some instances, it's just um, it's it's very it's a very tiny, tiny, minuscule fraction of the overall number of workers and employers in the United States. And um, I, you know, I, we are encouraging more of it with this global pandemic and the shutdown because a lot of restaurants may close permanently. And so we're encouraging restaurant owners to think about actually handing over the business to their workers with our support. We are looking at, you know, massive unemployed food service worker cooperatives that could compete with uh, Uber Eats and these companies to be worker owned food delivery and food service um, programs. So in general, it's a good thing. It's just not uh, where most people are and Supporting those restaurants alone isn't going to solve the bigger structural problem that we still have a $2 wage in this country. I mean, even if all restaurants switch to worker own, there would still be a federal minimum wage of $2.13 an hour. So we need to, yes, support worker owned restaurants. And in fact, hundreds of other restaurants that aren't worker owned, but have decided to pay their workers a livable wage. In fact, I'm going to put a website uh, in the chat. It's highroadrestaurants.org. Um, it's a place you can go to check out a list of restaurants that are doing it right around the country, about 800 of them. But um, yes, so support worker owned, support restaurants that are doing it right, but way beyond that, as my, Mark has often said, and many others have said, we can't just eat in a different place and expect the problem to go away. We can't just vote with our fork and think that that's gonna solve the problem because we're not just consumers. As we just saw last week, we are people who actually can change the course of this country. So um, let's both support people who are doing it right and work together to fight to change the laws of this country. Because again, I think something we saw from this election is that if we aren't active in fighting for change, we're complicit in keeping the way things are. And one thing I'd like to share that I don't think most people know, I didn't know, is that Thanksgiving actually um, was not a real thing until the Civil War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln 
really created Thanksgiving as a national holiday the day after a very brutal battle that the Northerners won to celebrate the end of the Civil War and to give people a place to come together and celebrate. Yes, there had been that moment during the pilgrims and all that, but it really became a national holiday with the Civil War. And what I find so interesting about that is that um, I think it's important to think about the era that we've been in over the last four years. Like the Civil War, uh, it's been an era of division and division over race and division over long lasting legacies of racism in this country and an attempt by a leader to further divide us by race and use racism as a way to do that. And so again, I think for all of those reasons, thinking about this Thanksgiving as hopefully the end of that era, that like, like the original Thanksgiving was the end of the Civil War and a celebration of overcoming a divided nation. Can we think about this Thanksgiving as a sigh of relief, as a way to celebrate the end of a divided period by race uh, in which we finally come together and can start to heal and can start to acknowledge some of the legacies of slavery that exist to this day, like the $2 wage. You're here. Sorry, you have a very important follow-up question from Zhu Yen. Do you take volunteers at One Fair Wage? Oh, you're muted. Oh, Ari, can you unmute? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yes, you can go to that same website where I encourage you to donate, ofwemergencyfund.org. You can donate there to support workers in crisis. You can also click volunteer to volunteer. And one super exciting thing about that place that you go that uh, 250,000 workers applied to that emergency fund to get relief during the pandemic and people donated. We raised already $23 million. It's almost all gone, handed out to workers and so many thousands more have applied than we were able to fund. But that money that's going out to workers serves two purposes. It not only helps them get groceries maybe for this Thanksgiving so they too can celebrate Thanksgiving. It also has involved them in a voter program so that this huge population of 250,000 low wage workers, 66% of whom had never ever voted before, all voted for the first time this year. So it's a pretty exciting uh, fund where you can not only contribute to worker survival and being able to feed their families, but also through that fund and you know help workers get engaged in democracy and their own future. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for one or two more questions before uh, we let Mark and Saru off the hook here. Um, I think uh, Christina wanted to know, Mark, what are you having for Thanksgiving this year? I don't know. So let's go to the next <laughs> question. I'm not sure right. what I'm doing. But it'll be maybe simple and you're not doing the full 12 course thing, well, right? I, I'm not cooking of that, okay. I'm sure. So yeah. <laughs> so you're going to be eating. Well, that's good. Um, and are you a sweets fan? Brooke wants to know, are there any favorite Thanksgiving desserts or suggestions for alternative or healthy options that you like? Those are two different questions, I guess. <laughs> All I'm right, a, what's sweets, your I'm a sweets fan and uh -huh. I think sweets are probably something we need to be eating less of. Uh, and I understand the difficulties of us doing that. There are obviously Thanksgiving, you're going to eat dessert. Um, are there, are there healthy desserts? Yeah, there are healthy desserts, but most of us don't eat them. So <laughs> it's, um, it's a tricky thing, dessert. Right. Well, okay. So here's one from Virginia. If you can only have one dish, what should you make? If you're having Thanksgiving and you're only having one dish, what should it be? Are you alone? Is this, are you alone for know. Thanksgiving? And you're we only did have a question dish? from a guy who's, I think it was a guy, um, a solo diner in Canada whose handle is Firehose, who's having a, a solo uh, Thanksgiving and was sort of struggling with only being able to buy a 16 pound turkey. Yeah, so. that seems a little. <laughs> <laughs> that was early on. I have to go back and find it in I the chat. I think if I were that person, I'd go into the store and buy a turkey thigh and make a turkey pot pie and eat that happily. Yes. So that maybe that answer will suffice anyway. I mean, I right. look, everybody's got different different tastes. I personally, I grew up in the Northeast. I ate a lot of fish growing up. I still eat a lot of fish. If I'm given options, 
seafood options, I tend to take them. So there's that. But people often ask, what's your go-to comfort food? And it's true that if I come home late and I'm exhausted and da 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 I always make some form of noodles. So yeah, that's a noodles. tough question. To, the simplest yeah. questions are always the toughest ones. I will tell you though, one of the things I love about Mark's Noble course is he's got a great lesson on these three master meals um, that you can make any time with sort of no recipe. And the one I keep going back to, because it just ticks all the boxes, it's plant-based, it's super healthy. Uh, it's just a chopped salad. Like I take every healthy thing I have, nuts, seeds, you know, and I make this amazing chopped salad and it just feels like it works really well. So uh, I, I highly recommend it. I think that's less than five or six in the course. Um, but, but that's always a great tip and something that's changed the way I eat. I made um, rice and beans for lunch, which is also one of those three One recipes. of the master meals. And we're yeah. not going to tell you guys the third. You have to listen to the course <laughs> to hear number three of the master meals. But rice and beans, the chopped salad, and the other one, all great options for simple, simple meals when you, you, um, you are looking for making something directly. So uh, we're gonna be following up with some, some of you have asked uh, about links. We will send out a, an email with a full recording of the session and we're gonna have links to everything and some of the Q and A's that, that came up in the chat. Um, we did have a shout out for that bacon onion jam that Mark uh, is known for. So I, maybe we can include that as well. Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, Mark, if you have any last piece of advice for us as we head into this potentially stressful food-induced holiday, um, how should people, what attitude should people have going in? I mean, come on, we have been so stressed out for the last four years and the last one year in particular that if you can't deal with Thanksgiving after all of this, it's... <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, keep things simple. Try to enjoy yourself. Keep your spirits high. Remember what to be thankful for. That's my advice. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mark and Saru. I, I hope that all of you um, have a minute to uh, maybe head over to One Fair Wage, their emergency fund, and tip them a donation if you found this useful or helpful. We also want to offer all of you on this call a discount for a membership to Knowable if you would like to hear Mark's course in full. Uh, we have a discount code for 25% off. It's just Thanksgiving. Um, and so, you know, for those of you who don't know, Knowable is a library of audio courses that can help you learn amazing things on all kinds of subjects. We're really proud to have Mark's course on how to eat now in there. Um, and there's some always new courses today. Uh, we have a brand new course that just launched as well from astronaut Scott Kelly. So Thanksgiving is your code if you want to come in and hear the rest of Mark's amazing course with his, his 20 some lessons. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Saru. And, and don't forget one fair wage their emergency fund will be sending out that link again. Thank you, Have a great Amy. Thanksgiving, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Take it easy. All right. Bye. Thank Bye. you for joining.